Okay, I'd ask members and those in the public gallery leaving um, to do so as quickly and as quietly as possible. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 6216 in the name of Katie Clark on higher education workers dispute. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I'd invite members wishing to participate uh, to press the request to speak buttons uh, now or as soon as possible. And I call on Katie Clark to open the debate around seven minutes, Ms Clark. Thank you very much, Mr Presiding Officer, and it is a pleasure to speak to this motion on the higher education workers' dispute and to put on record my thanks to all members who gave it cross-party support. As the motion notes, at several universities there has already been strike action in recent months and many more staff are currently being balloted across the country. The most recent Unison strike took place on 4th October, when Unison members, mainly cleaners, administrators, library, catering, security and support staff, um, took part in action. And further action is due to take place on dates later this month at Edinburgh Napier, Glasgow Caledonian and Robert Gordon. They will be joined by EAIS, University Lecturers Association and the University and College Union union members who all have strike dates in November. The UCU action will be at every single of the 17 Scottish institutions on three dates later this month and will involve up to 8,000 members. Further ballots are ongoing at many other institutions, including the University of West Scotland in the West Scotland region I represent. Unite are also balloting their 2,000 members across 11 institutions. So we are facing disruption at universities across Scotland with staff, many of whom are on low pay, taking action despite the loss of income that will involve for them. And of course, students are being impacted. University of Glasgow members were also on strike, but earlier this month accepted a breakthrough pay deal that will see overall pay rises of between 6 and 12.9% this year, and the lowest paid there are now set to receive a £2,332 pay increase. However, the University and Colleges Employers Association say they have made their final offer to staff a below inflation pay award of 3% for most higher education workers and a 3 to 9% award for some of the lowest paid. So given the rate of inflation, these are real terms pay decreases. These strikes are about pay, but also about other terms and conditions. The UCU held two ballots one for strikes on pay and conditions, and one for strikes on pensions. In the pay and conditions ballot, 81.1% voted yes on a 57.8% turnout, and in the pensions ballot, the yes vote was higher, 84% on a 60.2% turnout. UCU say that the cuts to pensions, on average, are of in the region of 35% and are going ahead despite them being based on an outdated valuation of the pension fund. You, see, you also estimate that in the jobs they organise in the sector, pay has been cut by about 25% in real terms since 2009, and Unison estimate about a 20% cut for their members during the same time period. About one third of university staff in Scotland and across the UK are on precarious fixed term contracts and some of those workers have been on those contracts for upwards of 30 years. The average working week in education is now over 50 hours and UCU Scotland say in a survey that they conducted in June 2021, 76% of respondents report an increase in workload during the pandemic. 
A further more recent UCU survey from March this year found that two-thirds were considering leaving the sector due to poor pay and conditions. In response to debates of this nature, Scottish ministers normally say that institutions are independent and the terms and conditions of the staff there are not the responsibility of the Scottish Government. However, the Scottish Government provided more than £1 billion in funding to Scottish universities last year. These institutions are substantially funded by government and the sector generates income. The UK university se se sector generated income of £14.1 billion last year. It is estimated that vice chancellors themselves took pay packets of an estimated £40 five million pounds. So for example, the University of Edinburgh principal is reported to have a salary of an estimated three hundred and sixty three thousand pounds a year and the principal of the University of Glasgow three hundred and sixty eight thousand pounds per year. Education is fully devolved and the Scottish Government have responsibility for the model. And the model in our higher education system in Scotland is one of endemic low pay, poor conditions, excessive executive remuneration, casualised contracts and the marketisation of the sector. I urge the Scottish Government, as a major funder of the sector in Scotland, to get directly involved in these immediate disputes to urge universities and the University and Colleges Employers Association to take part in meaningful steps to negotiate a fair resolution to these disputes, to ensure that the Fair Work Convention is the minimum standard for accessing Scottish funding, council funding, and to look at how the Fair Work Convention can be strengthened and to investigate and report to this Parliament on employment conditions in the education sector and the higher education sector in particular as a priority. We have a system where students are treated as consumers, where many workers in the sector are paid a pittance on temporary contracts while vice-chancellors award themselves record pay packets. It's unsurprising that workers up and down the country are demanding improved pay and conditions. But the Scottish Government cannot stand back and claim to be bystanders in these disputes. They fund Scottish universities to the region of over £1 billion each year and have a responsibility to ensure that staff there are paid well, have proper employment practices and that the universities themselves who are provided with funds act as good employers. Thank you very much, Ms Clark. We now move to the open debate. I call first uh, Graham Day to be followed by Michael Mara uh, for up to around four minutes, Mr Day. Many thanks, President Officer. Um, industrial disputes are by their nature, as we're all too well aware, invariably messy and often unpleasant affairs. Uh, a mixture of over-ambitious, ill-judged, seemingly entrenched positions taken at the outset, when everyone knows that ground will have to be and will ultimately be ceded by the protagonists. And right now, with so many employment sectors understandably pressing for increases that address spiralling inflation levels, when it comes to attracting support and sympathy from the public uh, for pay claims, then the landscape is pretty congested. We have a number of public sector disputes rumbling away UK-wide, and the brutal truth is that sympathy for the likes of nurses and firefighters will perhaps be greater than for university staff and others. That's absolutely uh, not to say that this group isn't deserving of a fair but affordable pay increase which takes account of the cost of living. Far from it. It's simply an observation. Because the fact is that universities do not function, students do not secure their education without cleaners, administrators and library catering and security workers, never mind the teaching staff. And that's why I'm certain the Scottish Government will be uh, actively encouraging Scotland's universities to engage with the unions and apply the Fair Work 
principle. They are, though, as Katie Clark acknowledged, autonomous bodies. However, President Officer, amongst other things, universities need to be alive to the public relations damage done them by protracted disputes with staff, especially where they have parallel issues running, such as the pensions issue impacting non-teaching staff at Dundee. President Officer, I don't think there's any aspect of industrial relations where fairness is quite to the fore of the minds of the public than when it comes to pensions. Now, having come from the background I did, I am certainly instinctively inclined towards the cause of employees who are opposing seeing their pension expectations threatened. In another life, for 30 years, I worked in journalism, where it wasn't just the Maxwell scandal which left its mark. We also saw long-serving, far-from-well-paid journalists having non-contributory pension schemes removed and the legitimate terms and conditions of others labelled pension liabilities, as if they were unreasonable burdens, not the entitlements matched to many years of sterling service. And I don't think there's the slightest doubt that the initial approach by the University of Dundee to their superannuation scheme was cack-handed, to say the least. Attacking the pension rights of staff who are a long way from being the best remunerated in the institution is not a good look, especially when these are predominantly women, the gender worse served by some way by pension provision. Now, in fairness, I, I get the concerns of the university court over the growth of pension, let's call them responsibilities, and the increase in employer contributions. But that was the kind of ill-judged starting position I referred to earlier. We have seen some progress, not as much as staff might want or be content with, but progress. Now we need to see that being built upon and similar momentum taking hold on the salaries front at Dundee and across the sector, with both sides, presiding officer, as I said earlier, recognising that ground will have to be ceded. Presiding officer. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Day. I now call Michael Mara to be followed by Stephen Kerr for around four minutes, uh, Mr Mara. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I declare an interest um, as a member of the USS Pension Scheme for my 15 years' work in the Scottish higher education sector. I want to thank Katie Clark for bringing uh, this uh, motion for debate today, um, and uh, I'm happy to give, um, as she knows, the, the full backing of Scottish Labour's um, education policy. In terms of particularly, I think, the very um, sound recommendation that funding delivered through the Scottish Funding Council and via the Scot from the Scottish taxpayer um, should be guaranteed on the baseline frankly, of a fair work convention. And actually, the uh, university should be adhering to that. I think it's a very sound suggestion. I think that the minister um, should address that uh, in his remarks. Um, and it's absolutely right that employers get back around the table on all of these disputes, and the disputes that, um, that Katie Clark has highlighted in her remarks, and also um, the dispute that, uh, that Mr Graham Day has highlighted also. Um, but we do know that pay disputes across the public sector are being driven by an economic climate, a global economic climate, that frankly has only been worsened in the UK by the grotesque incompetence of the Conservative government, who are just today in Parliament trying to uh, ask citizens across the UK, UK to pay the cost of their right-wing ideological economic fantasies. And it's staff in our universities uh, whose situation we are debating here are, of course, victims of that incompetence too. And the impact of inflation is now compounded by the tax hikes and service cuts just announced by the Chancellor in the last hour. And we have to uh, ask our universities, of course, to recognise that climate. And they must strain every sinew to find the resources to strike the right pay deal uh, for our lecturers and support staff right across Scotland. Their work is absolutely crucial, not just to today, in terms of the students they work with, but to the future of our country. And I have to say that industrial relations across the sector, as highlighted by other members, are indeed strained. And as a Dundonian, it's become a matter of great concern, and frankly, as a long-term former employee of the University of Dundee, a shameful sight to see that industrial relations have deteriorated to the level that they have. And those pension cuts to the lowest paid and predominantly female workforce are completely unacceptable. The management must be round the table with all of the campus unions, and they should do so immediately. Uh, but we must also recognise in this debate that the Scottish Government, what the Scottish have done to increase the budget pressures on our universities. The resource spending review slashed the funds to tertiary education in the years to come by 8%, with as yet no indication as to the balance of those cuts between colleges and universities. And that means that universities do not yet know the real scale of the cuts that they will face and how they, can, how they may be able to plan their uh, future workforce and the, uh, the, the projects and the uh, investment that they have to make. It makes planning impossible, and the Minister should be providing that clarity as soon as possible. But it is not just a short-term issue 
of recent months. The Scottish Government, government have provided no increase in the funding of Scottish student education for 13 years. And the balance sheet of Scottish universities are deeply worrying as a result. Most Scottish universities, it's fair to say. And that is reflected in the comparative performances of our universities. And I've covered this in the Chamber on numerous occasions now. In the uh, recent REF, um, the, um, the universities in Scotland not improving at the pace of universities across the UK. And in the Times Higher Education World University Rankings, just published yesterday, three outstanding Scottish universities in the world's top 200. A decade ago, that number was five. And that's a reflection of the direction of travel in Scotland and a very worrying one for the future uh, of our country. Because the people who make that success possible are the very employees whose working conditions we are here to discuss today. And Scottish Labour calls for new negotiations and a deal for all of those workers that protects the workers' futures and the future success of Scotland. Thank you, Mr Mara. I now call Stephen Kerr to be followed by Mercedes Vialba. Around four minutes, Mr Kerr. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. <clears throat> First of all, I note the contents of the motion and find myself broadly in agreement with what is fundamentally being said in this debate, which is that the university principals and administrations should get together with the representatives of their workforces and resolve this dispute. Because at the heart of all of these matters is the interests of the generation who are now depending on the good work that is being done in our universities and colleges, not only for their own individual success, but for the future success of our country. And I listened to Michael Marr, for whom I have enormous respect, and would gently suggest to him that perhaps he should check the detail of what the Chancellor actually said, and particularly the commentary of the OBR. Um, Kate, Katie Clark is absolutely right when she talks about education being wholly devolved. And therefore, any issues that we address in this debate uh, respecting the performance of the government in their lack of public investment over a decade, that's what the minister needs to respond to. Not... Of course. Minister. Would he recognise, though, that fundamentally this is an industrial dispute about industrial relations related to matters around pay, terms and conditions, which are inextricably interlinked with employment law, which we don't have control over. That remains in the hands of the UK government. Stephen Kerr, I'll give you time back. intrinsically interlinked with the fact that, you've been, uh, that, that, that this government has been underfunding the further and higher education sector in this country for 10 years. That's the framework in which these issues are being addressed. This is a wholly devolved matter. The buck stops with this government and this minister in particular. The fact is that this sector, upon which we all depend for our future prosperity, is, it needs greater levels of sustainable funding. And for far too long, we have seen this SNP Scottish Government neglect the further education, higher education sector. And because of this, budget cuts year after year, we've seen cuts to the numbers of college students across Scotland, a cap on the number of Scots permitted to attend universities. We've seen the university sector having to go across the globe, sometimes involving themselves in what I can only describe as dubious international schemes to raise money, potentially undermining the independence and integrity of those very institutions, many of which are world class. And now we're seeing this contribute to the strikes uh, by lecturers and other staff at Scottish universities and colleges who are concerned about their pay, working conditions and pensions. Because since 2010, in real terms per student, university funding has fallen by 9.4%. Those are the Scottish Government's own figures. And I've written a uh, question that, that, that I submitted, S6W01165. The Cabinet Secretary uh, told me that 2010-2011, the average university student funding was £6,525 in real terms, and the figure now, £5,703. And the effects of these cuts is clear. And the fact that funding from the fees of international students is set to overtake the funding the Scottish Government makes available to Scotland's universities next year is evidence of the fact, as University of Scotland have made clear, that now those international students' fees are cross-subsidising Scottish students' places and the teaching budgets of these institutions of higher education. 
and we've also seen the effect of these SNP spending cuts on Scotland's colleges. The principal of Glasgow Kelvin College has said that 80% of accessible income or revenue is spent on staff costs. Let me conclude, because I'm running out of time, by reiterating that if Scottish Conservatives believe that the university principals, I would love to, but I don't know if I'm allowed. You are winding up at the moment, uh, Mr Kerr. I, I apologise. I like to take interventions, as, as I think the Chamber knows. The Scottish uh, Conservatives believe that the university principals and the representatives of their employees need to get around the table. But the Scottish Government needs to take responsibility for the consequences of the decisions it has made based on some form of hierarchy of political priorities. Scotland's universities should be the envy of the world. Our reputation as a country stands on our higher and further education. And it's time that the, Scottish, the SNP Scottish Government gave proper funding priority to Scotland's universities and colleges so that lecturers and staff will feel and share in the pride of being part of this great national success story. Thank you, Mr Kerr. I now call on Mercedes Vialba to be followed by Richard Leonard for around four minutes. Uh, Ms Vialba. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I refer members to my register of interests and I thank my comrade Katie Clark for securing this important debate today. As a former rep for the University and Colleges Union, the UCU, I know all too well the struggles that staff in higher education are facing. For years, these workers have been undervalued as both the UK and Scottish governments have allowed low pay, casualisation and poor working conditions to become rife across the sector. So I stand with these workers as they take industrial action and join them in their calls for a real pay rise after years of below inflation wages, for an end to precarious contracts which lead to poor working conditions and dangerously high workloads, and pensions which allow them to have dignity in retirement, not pensions that have been cut to the bone. Presiding officer, as I've already mentioned, prior to election I was a UCU rep and a particular issue which members face then and now is the increasing casualisation of work in higher education. So I'd like to share some testimony from a UCU member at the University of Dundee which highlights the human impact of casualisation. In their words, I've been teaching at universities in the UK for five years, teaching English and academic skills to students who want to come and study in the UK. In that time, I've been on more than 10 temporary contracts, all of them either part-time or fractional. Most of my students will pay more for their master's course than I will make in a year. It's just not possible to plan a life under these conditions. It's nearly impossible to get a mortgage because temporary contracts are seen as too risky by the bank. You can't afford to pay for further training and qualifications because your pay is so low. Starting a family seems impossible when you don't know if you'll have a contract this semester or if you might need to move to another city for work. When I got my first job at university, I was excited because I thought I'd made it. Now, I wouldn't recommend the higher education sector to anyone who wants to start a family or build a stable, kind, a stable life of any kind. I plan to retrain and leave the sector at the next opportunity and I know I'm not alone. Presiding officer, the UCU member whose testimony I just shared is not alone. The issues which they face reflect the systemic challenges facing university staff. As we've already heard today at the University of Dundee, senior management are pushing through pension cuts without meaningful negotiations with the affected workers or their trade union representatives in Unite, in Unison and in UCU. The Scottish Government has refused to engage, despite often emphasising the importance of fair work. The First Minister, the Education Ministers, even their officials, all failed to meet with a delegation of workers and their Unite representatives in Parliament just two weeks ago. Presiding Officer, where is the... F uh, yeah, I'll take an intervention. Uh, Minister. I can only respectfully suggest such an invitation never made its way to me. I have met with the unions from Dundee. I've met with folk from Dundee on the ground. I've spoken with them. So I'm sorry to say 
uh, that that is news to me. And if that delegation wants to write to me, I'll be happy to consider meeting with them. Mercedes Villalba, I can give you the time back. I thank the Minister for his intervention and um, for his commitment to meeting with the workers. I'll pass that on. Um, the invitation was extended to every single MSP in Parliament, and I raised it at FMQs, uh, and I even said at the time and place. So um, I can only uh, apologise if the Minister wasn't um, paying attention that day. Presiding officer, where is the fairness in low pay, in casualised contracts and pe pension cuts that university staff in Dundee and across Scotland now face? And how can it be right that universities, which receive so much public funding, are able to defy the Scottish Government's fair work principles without being held to account? The growing marketisation of higher education has seen universities prioritise profit over people. We have to think bolder and transform our education system in the way we transformed public health with the creation of the NHS. This means aspiring for a national education service universally available from cradle to grave, providing well-paid, secure and unionised jobs for its staff and making lifelong learning a reality for all. Thank you, Ms. Vialba. I now call Richard Leonard for around four minutes, Mr. Leonard. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I refer members to my register of interests? And can I also thank Katie Clark for bringing this important question back before Parliament? Because once again, we are debating higher education at the very point when our trade unions are on the brink of industrial action. Once again, we are debating it as we witness a fierce political attack on the democratic freedoms of workers and their organisations. And make no mistake, this is an attack so extreme, simply witnessing it is not enough. This is no time for neutrality. This is a time to step up, actively defend those workers, those trade unions, and those fundamental human rights and freedoms. Neither can we be neutral on the fate of our universities. Just last week, I visited the new Advanced Research Centre at the University of Glasgow. I listened, I listened to university teachers who told me about the rise in precarious employment. I listened, I listened to students who told me about the difference that access to higher education was making to their lives, but how hard their struggle was. So, while new capital investment in our university buildings is important, we also need equally bold new human investment in our university staff and students as well. And it reminds me that as we contemplate the aftermath of this afternoon's budget, and as this SNP Green Government contemplates yet more cuts to college and university funding, that we should never forget that there are those who will use financial cuts not as a side effect, but as an intended consequence to limit the choice open to working class students. I will give way, yes. Stephen Kerr. I rise to point out to Richard Leonard and the Chamber that the Chancellor's announcements today mean that from next year, this Scottish Government will have £1.5 billion more to spend on education and in other public services. Richard Leonard. Well, as they always say about budgets, the devil will be in the detail, and we shall see over the next few days what that really means uh, on the ground. Um, I will take an intervention. Michael Martin. I appreciate the, the member giving way. The, uh, the OBR in the accompanying notes for the uh, budget today reflects the fact that household income in the UK is expected to fall by 7% this year and 7% next year. Is that not the situation that workers and universities face as a result of the economic policies of the UK government? Richard Lynn. Uh, yes, I agree with Michael Maher entirely. And I think it's also the challenge, uh, as I was saying, that faces students from working class backgrounds who are much less likely to get the opportunity. Um, l let me turn, in the time I've got left, to, uh, to look at the UCU's uh, demands, which, in my view, uh, are very modest. Uh, all they are looking for is a meaningful pay rise and action to address pay inequality, an agreed framework to eliminate precarious employment practices and to tackle dangerously high workloads, and an entirely affordable reversal of the 35% cut to university workers' pensions 
a reinstatement of the university's pension scheme and a recognition that these are deferred earnings. So to the outstanding leaders of the UCU, Joe Grady and Mary Senior, and to other higher education trade unions in dispute, we say that you and your members have got our 100% support. And to the Scottish Government we say, of course we understand the importance of the autonomous status of our universities, of course we do. But they are not private businesses, they are public institutions, subject to public legislation, influence and regulation, and they are funded with public money. So I ask the Minister for Higher and Further Education, what is it going to take? When is he going to act? And finally, let me say this. In our democracy, trade unions are a line of defence for working people. But I hope that the day will come soon when they will not just be a line of defence. They will be an alternative line of advance, a vehicle through which people can participate in the running of our universities, our colleges, on all our public services, and yes, in the running of our industries as well, so that the people who know what works, those who create the wealth, including the wealth of knowledge in our education system, are no longer all the time defending, but have their status transformed. That would herald a new era, a new era of mutual aid and mutual respect, a new era of social and economic responsibility, and a new era of progress for working people in this country. Thank you very much, Mr Leonard. I now invite the Minister to respond to the debate for around seven minutes. Minister. Thank you very much, President Officer. Can I begin by thanking Katie Clark for bringing forward uh, the motion that we debate today. These are uh, important issues and it is entirely appropriate that we debate them in uh, this uh, Parliament. At the outset of uh, my uh, remarks, though, I do want to place on record my uh, thanks to those who work in our universities, be they our lecturing staff, be they uh, the support uh, staff who work in our institutions. Uh, they uh, keep our campuses uh, running smoothly. They make sure our students are uh, supported and uh, get the education they require. And I recognise in that context, President Officer, the last uh, few years have not been uh, easy uh, for, uh, for many sectors and for the university sector uh, 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 as well uh, in working through the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's all credit to those who've worked in the sector to have sustained it, and I have to say to sustain it in continuing to be the envy of the world. I was uh, surprised to hear Stephen Kerr saying it should be the envy of the world. He should know that we have world-class, outstanding excellence in our universities and uh, I'm sure it was an inadvertent uh, suggestion uh, otherwise by Mr Cairn saying that they should be the envy of the world. We, they are uh, the envy of the world. Uh, in respect of where the workforce uh, relations are right now, uh, my clear view is that uh, workers in our universities uh, should uh, continue to be uh, supported. That is of vital importance. We need to rely on them to help uh, our institutions uh, continue to rebuild and bounce back from uh, the uh, post-Brexit, post-Covid uh, economy to help us enable to move towards uh, net zero, to respond to the imperatives of upskilling and reskilling and continue to deliver world-class teaching, research and knowledge exchange. Of course I will. Stephen Kerr. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. And how on earth are they going to do that when this Scottish Government, this SNP Scottish Government, is cutting public funding to universities and to colleges? Take Glasgow Kelvin College. Here's what the principal says, Derek Smeal, that when he looks at the financial prospectus that the SNP are proposing, the impact looks at this early stage to be likely to mean a reduction in my workforce of 25% by year five, which is 2027. That's what the SNP have got on offer to this sector. So when he talks about bouncing back, how are they supposed to do that when you're not funding them properly? Minister, I can give you the time back. Well, when he talks about that, what he fails to mention, and I think it is important that we place this in its proper context, is that today, 
As things stand, the Scottish Government's budget now is worth £1.7 billion less than when it was published in December 2021. The framework that we've laid out through the spending review is predicated on what we expect to be available uh, to spend through the public purse as a consequence of decisions taken by Mr Kerr's party in government. That's the reality of what we have to deal with, and we will seek to rise to the occasion and do what we can to continue to support the sector, both universities and colleges. Right now, and I heard Katie Clark say it, I think she was saying it very positively, that we invest £1 billion, £1.1 billion to be precise, presiding officer, in our university sector. That's a substantial investment. We'll continue to invest in the sector. Of course, I'll give way. Uh, Michael Martin. I thank the Minister for giving way. I, mean, I, I think we all have sympathy, certainly, about the, the current financial situation, and I've addressed some of that in my speech. Because the Minister has to recognise that the amount of money that the Scottish Government has provided for Scottish students has not increased for 13 years. Is that not part of the root cause of the issue in terms of why we're talking about terms and conditions for Scottish workers in universities? Minister. Well, actually, what we've seen this year is there's been an uplift in the teaching grant to universities uh, being delivered through decisions taken by the Scottish uh, Funding Council. So we do continue uh, to invest, and we will also continue to invest in the substantial package of student support that we have in place, which, of course, enables Scottish students to attend university without having to pay uh, the excessive and exorbitant fees that other students uh, in the rest of the UK uh, have to uh, uh, pay. Uh, let me return to the industrial uh, dispute, because after all, that is the primary focus of today's uh, debate, uh, President Officer. Uh, Ms Clark, I, I'm sorry if I'm going to disappoint her, but I'm going to be consistent with what I have said before. It is fundamentally uh, the case that we are not, uh, that the Scottish Government is not a direct party to the negotiation uh, process. We have not got the ability to intervene directly, to determine, to dictate and to participate in how these negotiations uh, will uh, be taken forward. And I think it is important, and this hasn't been, I'll take, give away in a wee second, this hasn't uh, been set out by any member thus far. Of course, there are some disputes that are local, the Dundee one, for example, and the uh, uh, issues at, at Glasgow. But for lecturers, the framework for negotiations is not a Scottish-specific one, it's a UK-wide one. And that's the context, and that's the reality that we're dealing with. So we will seek to continue to influence matters. We will seek to continue to engage, but it is against that reality. And I'll give way on that. Katie Clark. Yes. And, I mean, does the minister accept that the model in higher education in Scotland is, as I outlined, a sector of endemic low pay, poor conditions, excessive executive remuneration, casualised contracts and marketisation? Does he accept that it is the Scottish Government's responsibility to ensure that the model is one that is acceptable to the people of Scotland? And will he look at how the Fair Work Convention and employment practices in this sector can be improved? Minister. Well, of course I accept the responsibility that we have to bring our influence to bear to improve in these matters. I recognise there are issues right across the labour market, incidentally, not just in this sector, but right across the labour market in terms of uh, the way the labour market is structured. And um, I would remind Ms Clark that uh, fundamentally much of these things come back to employment law and how the labour market is regulated more widely, and that is not directly uh, in our gift. But let me come back to uh, the industrial... I think I've given way a, a number of times now, President Officer. The Minister has taken a number of interventions. I, I think it's only reasonable to listen to his responses and not provide a running commentary on them, uh, Minister. I can assure you the running commentary was not setting me off my stride, uh, President Officer, but I uh, appreciate the, the sentiment. Let me come back to uh, the process of uh, negotiation, because I do accept there is a, a role, and I'm not trying to abdicate that responsibility. And I have sought to engage at every turn with both uh, the uh, institutions through Universities Scotland, uh, through uh, the unions representing the workforce, to urge them to come together to negotiate and come to a settlement that is fair and it supports the, the, the workforce. Uh, in that regard, Mr Day is quite correct in his estimation of our involvement. We are involved. We are seeking to bring our influence uh, to bear. Since I became Minister with Responsibility for Higher Education, I have uh, undertaken the discharge of that responsibility on a regular basis, engaging 
uh, with all uh, parties. Just last week, I spoke with UCU. Uh, on the 27th of October, I spoke with Unite uh, and Unison. This week, I have written to the University and College Employers Association, copied it to University of Scotland, continuing to urge them to engage uh, with one another to make sure that this uh, matter can be resolved and resolved in a satisfactory uh, fashion. And again, on the Dundee uh, situation specifically, I have regularly engaged with both uh, unions and in the management. And if uh, Ms Vialba wants to uh, uh, contact me about another uh, uh, chance to engage with uh, workforce representatives, I will be happy uh, to do so. Let me conclude, uh, presiding officer, uh, as I think uh, you would probably want me uh, to do it now. I, I take our responsibilities to all workers in Scotland uh, seriously. Uh, and that includes those who work in our academic institutions. We are serious about advancing a fair work agenda. We are serious about seeing the fair work framework uh, put into place. And through the Scottish Funding Council, through our own efforts, we will uh, strain every sinew, pull every lever at our, uh, uh, in our hands to make sure that we can further that agenda. But fundamentally, this is a situation that requires further engagement, dialogue between management and the workforce to be successfully resolved. And I can assure members that I will continue to play my part in engaging with both parties to try and bring this to a successful resolution. Thank you very much indeed, Minister. That concludes the debate and I suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30 this afternoon. Thank you.